Glad to see you here. And um, first Sunday of April, moving right along. All right, we are in the book of um, Acts. We have uh, got into chapter 2, that important chapter that is the account of the beginning of the church. We took some time to explain that. It's not just uh, an arbitrary decision. <clears throat> We're just going to say it. Uh, all the evidence of Scripture pushing together uh, points to the fact that this is when the church began. It could not have begun before. It could not have begun after because all the things were done there. And we have the, the actual evidence that they were added to the church. So um, that's what happens when you uh, put all that together. Well, um, we were talking about, welcome back. <laughs> yeah. Um, we we're talking about how that uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them, uh, pretty dramatic. Uh, fire seemed to appear, perhaps in a, in a large fireball, and it broke apart and spread apart and, uh, and then distributed itself uh, over the uh, uh, heads of the each one, so that it looked like they were, I don't know, candles or something standing there. And then uh, they began to speak. The word used is of a, uh, a very emphatic utterance. And what they were speaking were in all the languages from around the world. And um, each one evidently speaking a different language. There were 120 of them there, or at least it could have been. Um, the people listening recognized they're speaking in the language of where the land we were born. So the question is, what's going on here? And to address that in the common tongue, the Apostle Peter stands, and we're looking at the sermon that was brought, chapter 2, verses 14 to 40. And uh, he makes the announcement in 14 to 21, First, the rallying of the hearers, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. You know, uh, with my hearing uh, not as good as it used to be, um, and perhaps my attention span uh, being as uh, difficult as that as well, I've noticed that uh, there needs to be some of this going on. My wife will, I'll, I'll discover that she's talking to me in the midst of some sentence. And, uh, yeah, and the thing is, uh, not that this surprises her, you see, she knows this. Uh, so at that point, my attention is turned to her. I recognize she's speaking to me. She talks out loud to things. Her, her phone, the radio. She, she has great expectations about all these things, and if they're not meeting her expectations, she talks to them. And um, she talks through the window to the, to the woods behind our house and announces that the woodpecker is there and that the, that, that, that the, squirrels, are, the squirrels are frisky out there and uh, the, all these different things. And um, so I, I turn and get my attention drawn to her and I find that I've already missed most of what she was saying. So, um, you know, it, uh, what Peter did here is that people were distracted and, and people were talking and one saying another. And so he said, I'm going to talk now, uh, listen to me. So uh, I, I just bring this up that it might be a good idea to actually comment to someone about that I'd like to talk to you or that I uh, would like to say something to you to, to direct their attention to you before you speak. 
Um, with the 11, this includes Matthias. It matches Acts 1.26. They gave forth their lots. The lot fell upon Matthias. He was numbered <coughs> with the 11 apostles. And I, I'm tired of hearing how that he was the wrong choice and Paul was the right choice. Paul was also a choice, but he was the, like the 13th, the one, not, not one of the 12. This word said, he said unto them, is that same word that we were talking about, translated utterance back in 2.4, impassioned speech. So the same kind of speech that he had been using when he was speaking, I don't know, German or something. Uh, now he speaks in uh, Greek language. We find uh, not after the rallying, there's the rebuttal of the mockers. First of all, the filling of wine denied. He says, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Peter and his audience both knew that the Jews did not eat or drink before the third hour of the day at feast time. That was just part of the part of the way of working it. The Jewish third hour is 9 o'clock in the morning. This would correspond to the Roman ninth hour. Uh, Peter's word, as you suppose, are very gentle. He does not antagonate, uh, antagonize his audience. Uh, don't be stupid. He doesn't say that. See? Uh, uh, no, no, that's not it. He takes it kind of good humoredly. Then the focusing on prophecy is declared. And verse 16, he gets their attention right away. These are Jews. These are people raised with the word of God. The Old, Old Testament. These were people who were taught this from their earliest years. And so now he says, yes, certainly. Well, um, many did. Well, many of the Jews did. They, he came to the Jews. Many of them did. Uh, but th there was a uh, a political tug of war. They didn't. The, the leaders didn't want him to take over their place of leadership, so they just connived to have him put to death. So focusing on the prophecy, verse 16, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He says, to some degree, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, uh, we find that going to that passage in Joel, we find that uh, not everything that he was talking about was fulfilled at this time. So my comment here is, while Peter definitely connects this event to Joel's prophecy, he carefully makes no statement that this event fulfills the prophecy. Joel's prophecy deals with the tribulation period to come. Literally, Peter says, this is the thing spoken through the prophet Joel. So uh, Prop prophet Joel talked about this is basically the, the concept here. Then the reminder of prophecy, verses 17 to 21. Actually, uh, Peter wanted to defend the testimony just uttered under the Spirit's power in the foreign tongues. This is confirmed by the phrase, and they shall prophesy in verse 18, which is not found in any Greek or Hebrew text of Joel. It, um, he, is, he is saying this but he's not quoting the Old Testament scripture, evidently inserted by Peter to emphasize his point that the miraculous testimony of Pentecost was something to be expected to the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. Therefore, we should not consider Pentecost the beginning of the day of the Lord or the beginning of the kingdom. So look with me then, uh, we look at the passage that he was referring to is Joel 2, 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, 
blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. The day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord here, capital L-O-R-D, is the, um, is the coming of Christ, the day of judgment. And the tribulation period is that which uh, just precedes it. So uh, by extension, the tribulation period is that day. Uh, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This is the very point at his return uh, when all Israel will be saved. So with that background, we come to the outpouring is the sign of similarities, verses 17 to 20. Now here we're back to Acts. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. That's the part that he added in. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So this is his um, bringing to their memory this great um, work, this great um, uh, uh, prophecy from Joel. So uh, this has been a, a confusing uh, passage for those who were mixed up about their eschatology. Now, we can recognize that certainly this is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And Joel is talking about that and much more. But here is the beginning of it. See? That's what he's talking about. So the outpouring is the sign of similarities, and then the outpouring is the sign of salvation. Verse 21, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We saw that in uh, Joel. Uh, the word was delivered there. And he quotes the extended passage, 19 to 20 in Joel, so that he could include the promise of salvation. He, uh, he takes the whole passage. They didn't have the verse numbers in his day. So he's quoting the whole passage that includes the pouring out of the Spirit and the uh, uh, opportunity of salvation. Joel 2.32a says, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And uh, uh, this is, that's what salvation is, be delivered from whatever problem you're being saved from. So with that introduction, <clears throat> he says, um, pay attention to what's happening here. Because God is working. God is moving. And of course we recognize that this is uh, the, the new covenant, that Christ came, his blood who came to establish the new covenant, and um, he came to shed his blood to establish it. And as we see this, uh, we recognize that this was then the beginning of the church, so this is uh, uh, the way he's explaining it. Now, we come to the argument in verses 22 to 36, the proofs in 22 to 35. First of all, Jesus' record of his signs, 22 to 23. He mentions, first of all, his person, 22a, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was the place where he grew up, Bethlehem being the place where he was born. But this is the, the terminology for Jesus and his humanity. Um, when you're speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, you're talking about the one who was despised, the one who was uh, raised up uh, in a place where they didn't respect that, was not in the, uh, the accepted place of Judea. So um, it speaks of him as born on planet Earth. And then his perfection, a man approved of God among you, 
by miracles and wonders and signs. Now these three words are used rather interchangeably for miracles, but that looks at them in different ways. Which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Jesus went from Galilee down to Judea and uh, was healing, doing, performing these miracles uh, everywhere he went. A man approved of God. It indicates that Christ's miracles were a sign of his authority from God. Uh, it's very hard for the theologians to accept the fact that Christ set aside the uh, privileges of his Godhead when he came to earth. It makes obvious sense uh, to, to, to be born, to be carried in the womb with omniscience. I mean, that's, that would just be horrible. <laughs> um, to have a, the little baby opening his eyes and with all knowledge and able to speak and know all things, it, that, was not, that, that would not connect with humanity. So he came as a human must come, you see. Um, so the miracles showed his connection to God. Uh, he performed miracles, and the miracles pointed to him being the Messiah. But he performed the miracles by the power of God, as all humans perform miracles, if they perform them at all. Jesus performed his miracles during the time of his humanity, as the prophets did before and the apostles did later. God did them through the word, the Greek word dia, through him. This is because Jesus set aside his independent use of his divine powers. Philippians 2, 7, literally he emptied himself. Satan tempted him to use those powers independently of God when he urged him to turn the stone into bread. Uh, that would have been, uh, you know, his decision to do the miracle to feed himself. And uh, we read that in Matthew and Luke. Then he speaks of his passion, verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. This did not take God by surprise. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He's addressing the people in general. And he says, you who welcomed his miracles, you who benefited from his healing, joined in the crowd and said, crucify him. Determinate counsel means predetermined plan. Uh, determinate is Strong's 3724, horizo, a uh, perfect passive participle indicating the state of completion. It stands determined. When you recognize that this plan of salvation, this new covenant plan, was uh, set, was in place, Ephesians 1 tells us, before God created man before the foundations of the earth were set. Uh, that means it was set beforehand. It was determined ahead of time that he would have to die for the salvation of man to be allowed. This word counsel is Strong's 1012, boule. It means, and it, from, the, uh, from the verb, uh, uh, meaning a determination or a purpose. So what's being talked about here? Well, the triune God had determined from the beginning to bring forth the new covenant. This is what they call it for the Jews because they had the old covenant and then it would be a new covenant. Jesus as the lamb of sacrifice and as the high priest to present the blood before God to allow mankind to be saved even though born into sin and therefore headed to eternal death. Notice that the fact God predetermined Jesus would be delivered up to death does not remove any man's guilt for the sin. God determined it, and you, by wicked hands, did it. By wicked hands, that's the Romans that actually nailed him and, and killed him. 
Um, Jesus also emphasized this. In Luke 22, 22, Truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. That referring to Judas. Uh, everybody connected with killing Jesus um, is, is uh, condemned of God. Now, they were already unsaved, and so they were under his condemnation. But um, he says, God's will does not excuse what man does. God does not make people do this. The fact of it was determined that it would happen, but who did it, that was up to them. Then we see Jesus' resurrection of his body, 27 to 32. This part of Peter's message answers the question, how can a crucified man be the messianic king? Now, I don't mean to imply here that somebody actually called out that question. It was the question in the minds of the people. Uh, his death was interpreted as then he wasn't the messianic king that we had hoped. See. So notice how he deals with this. The release from death, verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Released him. See. Because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. What chains of death could hold back the omnipotent God? Loose the pains of death is literally loosing the birth pains of the death. Interesting combination of thoughts here. Death itself became a birth agony to Jesus to bring forth man's new birth of salvation. Notice that it was impossible, literally not able, for death to hold him. This is because death is the wages of sin. This is when the man, you know, was arrested and incarcerated, uh, but wasn't guilty. And so uh, must be released. So the release from death. Then we see the reference to his death in verses 25 to 31. He takes them back to the Old Testament with the reference to this, saying, you shouldn't have been surprised by this. And he, uh, talking to himself, you understand, I shouldn't have been surprised at this. But since that time, we have, we have made it pretty, a pretty good study in the Old Testament here. So he refers, first of all, to David's music, verses 25 to 28. I'm going to give you what he's talking about. First, from Psalm 16, 8 to 11, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth, my flesh also shall rest, the Hebrew dwell confid confidently, in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, in the presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Uh, don't be afraid of thinking of uh, life with God, life in heaven, as pleasurable. Uh, the true pleasures of life are ultimately fulfilled when we are loved supremely by God and taken into his family. It is, it is all the love of home and hearth and family and Thanksgiving dinner and all those things rolled into one wonderful, pleasurable experience. It is, it is a fulfillment of pleasure as we have never had it on planet Earth during our lifetime. So David's music. His godly life, 25 to 26 A. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. So, um, uh, speaking of David's godly life, but uh, actually referring to Jesus, Spurgeon comments on Psalm uh, 16, 8. Spurgeon has a wonderful uh, commentary on the Psalms. 
<clears throat> the eyes of Jesus' faith could discern beforehand the continuance of divine support to his suffering son. Uh, before he died, he could see that God would continue that in such a degree that he should never be moved from the accompaniment, accomplishment of his purpose of redeeming people. Uh, thy will be done, not my will, but thine be done. He says, uh, I'm on track to do whatever you want. By the power of God at his right hand, he foresaw that he should smite through all who rose up against him, and on that power he placed the firmest reliance. Uh, so David is speaking about <clears throat> a holy life, <clears throat> but the reference is clearly to Jesus. And then his guarded death, verses 26b to 27, Moreover also, my flesh shall rest in hope. Uh, Peter quoting this from, from the Psalms. Uh, shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Spurgeon again comments on Psalm 16.10, <coughs> Christ's resurrection is the cause, the earnest, the down payment, the guarantee, and the emblem of the rising of all his people. Let them therefore go to their graves as to their beds, resting their flesh among the, clo the clods, the clods of dirt, as they now do upon their couches, their beds. Uh, so um, just as welcome as a bed at the end of day, lay down, go to sleep, uh, welcome the death that just uh, lets you sleep, uh, close your eyes, and wake up with God. Now, leave my soul in hell. Leave is the word to abandon. Um, you know, we, we often leave house without abandoning house. I mean, we do while we're gone, I guess, but, um, but we're, we're not abandoning it. We're not leaving it for good. But this is leave to abandon. Hell here is Strong's 86, Hades, Hades, we say in English. Um, we want to remind you that while they translated both Gehenna and Hades as hell, I find that confusing. So I just, when I'm reading it and it says Hades, I say Hades because that was a different place. It's a temporary place of judgment that will be released when they go up to the great white throne judgment, and from there they are sent to the lake of fire, Gehenna, and that I call hell. That's my decision. You don't have to follow that decision. In Acts here and in verse 31, where this verse is explained, there are the only uses of Hades in the book of Acts. Hades, by its etymology, means unseen. And the word came from the, uh, was used at least in the Greek mythology. I don't know where Greek mythology got the word, uh, whether his origin was in God someplace along the line, but um, it refers to the unseen place of the dead, not of their bodies, which you could, with some investigation, see, uh, but the place of their spirits. Schofield's notes on Hades are in error. He adopted the two-compartment theory of Hades. This was invented long after the scriptures were written. Are you familiar with the two-compartment uh, based on the, uh, the parable that Christ gave of the rich man and Lazarus, that Hades was divided into two parts. There was the paradise and there was a place of torment and there was a, a, a gulf dividing it. And so you begin your day in paradise looking over at people agonizing in the fire. Uh, not my idea of paradise. Uh, but that, uh, that idea based on the parable of Christ uh, is in error, and it was something, as I say here, was invented afterwards. John Gill researched the matter thoroughly, found the Jews never held to this theory. It came about by the misinterpretation of Christ's parable to the rich man and Lazarus. Bishop Trench, in his study of parables, and he was considered the, the leader of all of that thought, 
declared that this was not a parable because it did not fit his definition of a parable. He came up with the definition of a parable and then said, well, then this doesn't fit that, so it's not a parable. That's a little uh, circular reasoning. Since it describes the situation and conversation of the rich man in terms of body parts, and the spirits in Hades do not have bodies until after they are resurrected to stand before the great white throne judgment, the story is shown to be a very instructive parallel. Uh, the emphasis is upon body parts. He doesn't say, alleviate my suffering with water. He says, put it to my tongue. You know, it's an emphasis on body parts. They didn't have body parts. They were spirit beings tormented. Um, so it's, it's clearly a parable, no matter what anybody says. Uh, so we're not going to base a two-compartment theory that nobody believed during the scripture time um, on that theory. I hope you reject it because it's a, it's a false thinking. So his guarded death. Then secondly, his glad resurrection. Verse 28, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now, David's meaning is explained then, verses 29 to 31. Peter now takes up the role of exposition. He exposes, he explains, he uh, goes into what David was saying. Not of himself, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Patriarch Patre, father, ark first, early fathers, that he is both dead and buried. I think we're clear on that, he said. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Nobody spared him from death. He was abandoned to death. <laughs> then of his descent, verse 30, therefore, therefore he was not speaking of himself, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So it's speaking of his, his descendant, of the Messiah. And then of the future, verse 31, he seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Again, that's Hades. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Uh, that which was prophesied then by David was referring to Jesus, not to David. A, a professor of mine in, in graduate school down at Bob Jones was convinced that the Greek structure here used was the locative sense of meaning. Locative, if you think of the the word itself is referring to place. And um, he said that leaving the soul in hell was locative, meaning his soul was not left to even reach Hades. You see that? That he hadn't been abandoned to reach that place, locative place, um, as his body was not uh, even allowed uh, to begin corruption. Now, I took note of that, and I thought, well, that's pretty nice, but I've not found anyone yet that agrees with him. Uh, no Greek scholar, no commentator uh, I've read, and I've read a lot about the book of Acts, just picked up a new commentary on Acts myself, a little one. Uh, nobody seems to have discovered this, except for him. So, uh, um, I like, I like what he's saying. I, I just can't confirm it by anybody else. Then he speaks of the raising up from death, verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all, and with one reference, he's talking to us, the, the 12, and to the uh, members of the, uh, those who had gathered, we are all witnesses. Now, that was their job to to speak of their eyewitness. On the other hand, this was not unknown to the people that he was speaking to. 
Peter offers the disciples as proof of the resurrection. They were eyewitnesses. And that on a very, very personal level. You remember that Jesus appeared uh, multiple times. One time actually in the room eating some food. I'm not a ghost, he says. Um, doing, doing various things. And then above 500 at once, probably at the Mount of mountains in Galilee, he uh, met with them, spoke to them, gave them the Great Commission. We see then Jesus' requisition of his spirit, verses 33 to 35. This part of Peter's message answers the question, if Jesus is the Messiah, why is he not now ruling? Why didn't he take the throne? Why are we not living in the kingdom? If he's the Messiah, the Messiah is supposed to do that. He didn't do it. See? So he's going to deal with that now. Let me go back to say that uh, uh, why did he die? That was part of the deal of being the Messiah. That was his answer. You see? This one now, if he was the Messiah, why is he not now ruling? And um, it be interesting to see how he deals with this. The exaltation of Christ, verse 33, his position, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. Exalted, we always think of that as being honored, that type of thing, but uh, here it's used literally of being lifted up. That's what exalted means. Exalted means lifted up, but we usually think of it as symbolically. Uh, but here, uh, he literally ascended to heaven. That's his place now, his position. Then his promise, verse 33b, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. Once he went to heaven, once he stood before God, once he presented the blood of his sacrifice, uh, as it were, then uh, God said, the work is done, Let's send the Holy Spirit down. The Father's promise was given in Jeremiah 31, 33, that part of the uh, promise of the new covenant. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those, those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. This is the adopting of them into his family. Uh, Jesus received that promise when he ascended to the throne of God and presented his blood to the Father. John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you, Christ says to the disciples, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, it's good for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So uh, uh, I and the Father will agree that the work was done, the work was finished, the new covenant was completed, therefore we send the Holy Spirit. So the promise, his position, his promise, and then his pouring out, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Uh, shed forth means poured out. And uh, he says, standing there before the throne of God, he has taken uh, the, uh, uh, the vessel of the that contains the Holy Spirit somehow, and poured it out on us. So this Jesus that you killed is alive, ascended to heaven, and poured this out as a testimony to you. This at last is the specific answer to what meaneth this. <laughs> What meaneth this is that the Holy Spirit has come because Christ accomplished his work. And God is now focused on completing that work with the church. Then the exposition of Christ, 25, 20, uh, 35, 30, whew, 34, 35. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. <clears throat> Psalm 110.1, 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, till I make thy foot, enemies thy footstool. Um, we really don't do that anymore. Make a, my enemy my footstool. Uh, conquer the enemy. He gets on hands and knees before your chair. 
and you cross your feet upon his back. Yes. Complete symbol of conquering. In case you completely conquer somebody, you want to give that image. That's what you do. So Peter uses the same reasoning with this passage as he did back in verse 29. David cannot have met himself. He must refer to the Messiah. Spurgeon quotes Andrew Bonar, the Puritan, an oft-quoted passage because it contains a memorable truth. We find it quoted by the Messiah himself to lead Israel to own him as a greater than David in Matthew 22, 44. It is quoted in Hebrews 1.13 to prove him higher far than angels. It is brought forward by Peter, Acts 2.34, to show him Lord as well as Christ. It is referred to in Hebrews 10.12-13 as declaring that Jesus has satisfactorily finished what he undertook to accomplish on earth, the one sacrifice forever, and is henceforth on that seat of divine honor, expecting, waiting with expectation, till his enemies be made his footstool in the day of his second coming. That's when he comes to conquer uh, sin on the earth, and uh, then ultimately when uh, the end of the thousand years is the, 1, 000, is the uh, great white throne judgment, and all sin is judged and extirpated. That was a good word. Uh, just uh, taken away, thrown away, thrown into the lake of fire. All right, well, we come then to the proposition. Let's, uh, let's finish this up. Verse 36. Jesus is master, verse 36a, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly this event that you have heard and seen means that Jesus accomplished. Therefore know this for sure that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord, this is the word meaning master, the one in control, let Israel know assuredly, the word assuredly means without fail, to cause to fall. Israel should know this for certain. He has been made the master. You killed him, he's now the master. You should make things right. And then he is Messiah. God hath made the same Jesus whom he crucified, both Lord and Christ. Uh, Christ could be translated even Christ. Um, the chi and can sometimes refer to even this, you know. So he is the master, even Christ, even the Messiah. All right, with that then we'll stop our time nearly up. And we'll look at then um, the uh, application of what he's uh, saying next time. Keep my papers in order here so I know what I'm doing. And uh, chapter 2, verses 37 to 40. Application. Always good to have the application. Here's the teaching, here's the truth, now here's what to do with it. So we'll be trying to do that in the morning session. You like my title? I went for long titles today. Being a godly wife when your husband is a jerk. I, I like that. So I'm sure none of our wives have ever noticed that their husband was a jerk. But just in case it might happen, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll recognize how you're supposed to act when that happens. So being a godly wife. And we'll make that truth known and then give the application. All right, thank you. Uh, stand together with me. We'll have our time in prayer. Father, you've given to us this monumental message given by the Apostle Peter, the one who was so afraid when a, a handmaiden said, you're one of them, that he denied Jesus. 
now so brave that he stands before the assembled group of Israel and points a finger saying, you killed Jesus, and now he's your master, and he is the Messiah. I ask, Father, that you might help us to be filled with the knowledge of the power of your resurrection, that we might have the courage of a Peter, put the old things, the old failures behind us, and recognize that uh, we can have a glorious, a bright testimony, a sparkling testimony, to be able to understand what we can accomplish in your place for you as ambassadors for Christ. We pray thy blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.